Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. This is the last one for 2016, and then we're into 2017. That's quite unbelievable. It's yep. been a quick year. It has been a quick year. But we've brought a very special podcast today, and this is kind of going deep into what we've been talking about for a very long time, which is education. Education of everybody, and in particular, young people that will eventually be changing the future. Absolutely. Uh, I had the opportunity, uh, along with uh, Julia Stoddart from uh, our sponsor, the Scottish Association for Country Sports, to go down to St. Joseph's College in Dumfries, uh, down in the southern part of Scotland, to talk to a whole group of uh, first years. Um, And along with that, we had a chance to record a podcast, which is exactly what we've done here. Ask them all manner of questions, from questions about grouse hunting to trophy hunting, and see what their thoughts and opinions were. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating for me. A lot of things which I thought uh, they would come up with, they did. Some things they came up with, I wouldn't have expected them to know. So I was, generally speaking, incredibly impressed. And it's a bit of an un- unusual podcast because there was so many people there. It, I think we had like f- there was 15, uh, 15 of us sitting around the table, uh, not including myself and, uh, and Jules. So uh, we wanted to give everybody a chance to have a little bit of, of input. So we didn't get the opportunity because we we're on quite a, a tight time frame. Uh, had to fit in between the periods of school, as you'll hear the bell go off at the end. Uh, we didn't have the chance to go into quite the amount of depth that I would have normally done. But I think it gives a, a pretty good, a pretty good overview, and certainly will let our listeners see what youngsters think of that certain age. I mean, it's amazing that it w- it, we managed to do it in the first place. So getting a period mm. of time is a good thing. So yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. I had a, a good time. And I've what I have done is I've put a, one or two very short interjections that I've just recorded afterwards just with a, a couple of facts and figures that I didn't have at my fingertips and we didn't have t- uh, a time for in any case while we were recording. So I've just stuck them in afterwards. Yep, that's, that's it. Uh, and for the people that have entered the seven days of christmas podcast you should all have either received your prizes or be receiving so just be patient they are all on the way one has been delivered in person yes uh, I need to do some that. of them are were big parcels some of them were sent on the cutoff date for christmas and as the guy at the post office said to me he said well stuff hasn't even been delivered from last week <laughs> when i spoke to him so it's not our fault blame the royal mail <laughs> Um, we won't be giving you um, a prize for this last podcast of the year because we are we've we've been throwing out prizes <laughs> left, right, and center yeah. for the whole month of we're, December. We're tired now <laughs> of uh, posting, uh, but don't worry. Our first podcast of the new year in January, we will we'll have make, a we'll make it a good prize. one. We'll make it a good one, absolutely. And we're going to have a whole load of new and awesome guests as we get into yep. 2017. New year, things are going to change. I think we're going to have a new theme tune. Yes, I think we are. New theme tune. We're going to have uh, uh, new prizes, new guests. It's going to be a, a big year. I think it is. And we're, we're up to a lot of interesting things, which we will tell everybody about as and when we can. Yeah, we are. Uh, this podcast is supported and brought to you by the Scottish Association for Country Sports. Uh, they are Scotland and Northern Ireland's largest field f- sports advocacy body, representing members' interests across the whole of the UK from firearms licensing to wildlife and land management to broader field sports insurance and legal support. SAX is run by its members for its members. If you are not a member of a uh, shooting or countryside organization, I urge you to have a real long, hard think about why you're not a member. And a very good place to start is to check out the Scottish Association for Country Sport. Which is not just for Scottish people. I was just going to say that, but you beat me to it. Even if you live over the border, there's plenty of members there, lots of members in Northern Ireland. Don't uh, let the name cool. put you off. Yeah, they service people all over the United Kingdom. Absolutely. And uh, without, I was, I was oh. going to say, since I've still got people, this is a very, very good podcast in the aspect of education and getting young people involved. So I really do encourage, and I would ask all of our listeners to share this with with people. Yeah, and, and maybe even uh, particularly. A younger person yeah. kind of interested in field sports or even not interested because it'll give them an opportunity to hear from people their own age, hear their voices, hear what they have to say and see how we interact with them and just let them see that 
you know, the the, the door is open. Mm -hmm. And any questions that want to be asked with regard to field sports, hunting, fishing, anything related to that, it can be asked. And, and it should be answered by people, you know, within, within the industry and within our community. Yeah, so that's all I ask is that for that. We're going to be doing more of these kind of uh, live shows throughout the year, uh, visiting people. We're going to be doing some at game fairs as well. I think the first one we're doing is Northern Shooting Show. So that will be kicking things off for the year of us doing podcasts away from base. Absolutely. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the Into the Wilderness podcast. It's This is definitely the biggest group of people we have ever done a podcast with. I did one in Sweden recently, and there was about 12 people around the table, but this is by far the biggest. So it's really great that you could all join us, and I cannot wait to hear what you think about hunting, field sports, fishing, and all these good things. What I'd like to start with is maybe just get an idea about your perceptions of let's just, let's just start with hunting. What is hunting? So whoever wants to start first, grab the microphone at the end of the table and just explain to me just just in a sentence what you think hunting is. Hunting is basically where you go outside and you start trying to find animals that you can shoot some. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's get a few other people, and then once uh, I've got a few comments, we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit. It's a sport of killing animals and using them for food, um, pest control, and more. Okay, that's good. We can shoot red deer and red hinds and lots of other different types of deer. Uh, it's not just about like uh, games, it's also like pest control and like keeping the species uh, at a minimum like kind of rate that they don't like expand so much that they don't have any food. So about management, yeah. Yeah. One more person for this. Um, it's about managing what we can shoot and what we can't shoot so there's limits on what we can and can't shoot so you can't just go around shooting everything you see yeah perfect so yeah i mean there's a lot of a lot of great points there uh you've pretty pretty much covered it H hunting as a term is actually incredibly broad i personally would even include fishing underneath the term hunting because it's kind of the same thing you're in the pursuit of an animal now, if I ask you the question, and if I'm going to pass the, uh, the microphone to the other side of the table now, as to is hunting good or bad? Let's, let's try and tackle that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll cover both of these, uh, both of these questions. Uh, yeah, good, good or bad, and if you say it's good or bad, maybe just give me a reason why. I think hunting is good, but other people might disagree with me for their own reasons. The reason that I think hunting is good is because... Like, um, like someone already said, it's like you can tr help control the pests so that you get enough crops and things that they don't all get eaten. And it's also that, uh, like in the like special places where you can hunt, like game reserves or something like that, uh, they are like the land is managed so that it's like it helps preserve other animals as well. So that's my opinion. Yeah, really good. It really depends on the context. If you're doing it. Uh, to keep the animals down so they don't die. I guess that would be okay, but if you were just doing it for your own benefit or for fun, it would be kind of bad and just yeah. cruel. That's, that's a good response. We'll, we'll come back to that. I think it's good because like you manage the animals so they don't get out of hand and start dying. I think it's quite good because we can get a lot of money for the Scottish economy and we can get rid of the likes of vermin, which do maybe farmers' crops and stuff. You would listen to the presentation. Good stuff. <laughs> uh, I think it's good for like, controlling stuff, but I think it's bad for just having fun, just like killing okay. stuff. Okay, good. I think it's good and bad. It's good because obviously we can like keep the like rate of the birds down but it also bad if like you're just doing it for fun and just want to just shoot animals. I think that's a bit cruel just for doing it for fun. But so both opinions. Okay, let's uh, let's stop there and let's just uh, talk about that for a minute. So, yeah, a lot of really great points there. Management was a big theme. Hunting for fun is uh, another one which came up a lot, and I want to talk a little bit about that. 
most people who hunt do it because they enjoy hunting. Otherwise, why would you do it unless you were doing it solely as a job? But as you, I think you probably all know, there are plenty of people who hunt, whether that be hunting with a shotgun for birds or stalking for deer, who do it because they enjoy it. It's a, it's a pastime. But what is maybe the, the misperception of it, which I think uh, will tie in with what some of you were saying, is that people are killing for fun. Now, there's a big difference between enjoying the actual activity of going out hunting and all the planning and preparation that goes into that, and then, of course, at the end of the day, putting food on the table, and the actual pulling the trigger and taking something's life. Now, obviously, I can't speak for everyone, but m the vast majority of hunters, if you are a, you know, an, an ethical hunter who really cares about the environment and the animals, which most are, the actual killing aspect of it is actually a really sad thing. Like, no one likes killing an animal, but they can really enjoy the activity of going through that process to do it in the first place. Um, so that's maybe a, a, a misperception, and you see that in the media a lot, especially when they start holding up things like you know trophy hunting, which we're going to talk, uh, talk on sort of in the second half of this podcast. Um, so that's maybe something just to get your head around a little bit is that just because someone really enjoys the activity of going out and hunting, it doesn't mean that they're enjoying the taking taking of the life. Uh, if you want to add anything to that, Jules. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I got into hunting at the age of 21. So I'm not from that background. And I started because I was really keen to provide my own food. Okay, ethical food, food that, you know, I know how that animal's died. So I feel more comfortable eating it. And I think, as I said to you in, in some of the, uh, in the presentation, you know, we did before, I, I used to be a vegetarian, not for a very long period because it didn't suit me. But, you know, when you start thinking about the questions of where does your food come from? And if you're going to eat anything, because don't forget that it's not just the eating of meat that kills animals. Okay. As we discussed earlier on in the presentation that I did for you guys, you have things like wood pigeon and deer and other animals that eat the crops that you eat. So whether it's a cereal crop or a fruit crop or a vegetable crop, animals die in the production of those crops. It's just, you know, whether you're actually going to eat them or not, if the animals die anyway, you know, what, what does that really have an impact on what you think about killing animals? Because there's not one of us around this table that hasn't caused the death of an animal at some point. It's about taking responsibility for that, okay? So it's a big kind of mature question to consider. But if you exist as a human being on modern planet, chances are, you know, you are going to be responsible for the demise of something out there. So what we as hunters do is we take responsibility for that process um, because we feel better about it. You know, we can sleep easily at night knowing that we've taken that responsibility, I think. Would you say that's fair, yeah, Byron? No, I think uh, you concisely put probably what I was fumbling about talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's a really, it's a, um, what Jules has just said is a, is a really important point because... Who? Well, let, let's ask this question. Who around this table thinks, and if you were listening to what Jules was just saying, you already know the answer to this, but who around this table thinks that, I don't know if any of you are, are vegetarian, and i got absolutely nothing against vegetarians, but who around the table thinks that if you are a vegetarian that you, uh, have, you've detached yourself from the killing of animals, as in with animals who have, which have blood, as opposed to vegetables and things that come off trees? I'm seeing blank faces. So do you all realize that even a crop in a field, there will be some correlation there between producing that crop and the death of something? I'm so everybody's nodding around the table. Well, you, you're a lot smarter than the vast majority of the general public, I think. Definitely. <laughs> because there, <laughs> there, there is most definitely... Uh, uh, perception that there is a, a line, a hard line between the two, and that some people who take the moral high high ground uh, and say that we shouldn't be hunting because or people shouldn't hunt because it's cruel, um, that they have no blood on their hands. But you've got to think about your impact or the things that you do and how that impacts on the world. So Jules was talking about crops. Take any crop you can pretty much think of. There's probably been some sort of crop protection. Uh, someone in the presentation mentioned uh, wood pigeons. I mean, that's a really common one. Wood pi pigeons eat a lot of crops, pretty much 
pretty much any crop that we grow in this country, I think uh, wood pigeons will probably have a feast on at some point throughout the year. And they will be either scared away with bangers or quite often shot. So you could be someone who doesn't eat meat and believes that you've got no blood on your hands. No, you're not responsible for the death of any animals. And that might be the very reason that you've taken that choice. But without thinking of it a little bit further and a little bit deeper, you haven't realized that, well, actually, there's a lot more that goes into the production of food than that sort of very, very, very simple view. Um, I think we're going to get back into that in a second, but I know that uh, one of the things that you will have looked at uh, was, the, and it's very, very topical because it was, it's been debated recently, is grouse shooting. So I could, if I could maybe just go around again, just start from where the microphone is, and maybe just tell me what you, what's your perception of grouse shooting, so driven grouse shooting, and who does it? And is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Maybe even tell me about what you've seen in the news. It was, it's been in the news quite a lot recently. Uh, or what if you think it's good or bad? Any comments on it at all? Driven grouse shooting is the topic. I think grouse shooting is a good thing because you can sort of eat grouse mm -hmm. and that. And it also takes away some of the pests and that they might eat, like mice and that. I think there is a balance between it because um, I think it's kind of well, it's kind of sad that they're born and raised just for the point of getting killed, but it's also good for like people who have to like help their families put food on their table. Okay. I agree that it's a good idea because it controls the numbers, but there's like I don't quite like the idea of them just being born to die, really. Mm -hmm. Grouse shooting isn't actually that bad because if you think about it, it's um, keeping generations like alive. So they may be killing them, but at least they're making sure there's more like being born and raised after that. Very good point. Yeah, I agree with that, but um, it's a good way to kind of socialise with other people and it's a good way to, of trying uh, grouse in itself as well. Well, me, me personally, I'm neutral. I'm sitting in the fence, but I'm... Hmm, I think it's... I'm not sure. For, for all, it provides us with food on the table and that it gets rid of pests. I personally think that... Well, these birds are not protected by law, so these birds could eventually become extinct at a certain point in the future. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I think there is a difference between like just killing an entire generation to like killing small numbers for like the rest of the population's like benefit. Like um, they're not just going out there to kill like all the grouse in like the whole field they're like slowly like it's like survival of the fittest like there can only be so many like grouse that uh, will survive anyways and um it's kind of like um making sure that we have the stronger ones that can um like feast and get stronger and then produce more for the population okay um, I think it's good because um, they're keeping away predators that we're going to kill them anyway. So if you're keeping away the predators, some of them were originally going to die. So it's just putting them to a better use than for being like foxes and things from them being killed and left there than being killed and eaten and their, their life isn't just for to be killed, it's for a greater purpose. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like when we cut down trees, we always replace them. And it's not like you just cut down a whole forest and leave it. You always have a backup plan if something, if the say trees get knocked down. Uh, good analogy, right. One more and then we'll talk about this. Uh, well, I think it's a good thing because um, if like you've never tried grouse before and you take up shooting, 
uh, you um, if you're like killing them, I think that uh, you'll definitely like try it and like it's good because you can get food from it and it will feed like lots of people. Perfect. Okay, there's a there's a ton of things come from that. Uh, I'm just trying to think where to start. The first thing is maybe I could just paint a little picture for you for maybe those people who don't f fully understand sort of grouse shooting. I'll try and do it as briefly as I can. So grouse, uh, and it's red grouse that we're talking about here, are found up in, in the moorlands in Scotland and in England, but we, we've got a lot of them in Scotland. And you find the vast majority of grouse, grouse on managed moorland because it takes quite a lot of work to manage the ground so that you get good numbers of grouse. So if you were to have a look on the west coast, for example, where there's not a lot of uh, area managed for grouse, you'll find far smaller numbers. So you've got that part to play in that grouse shooting as an activity is able to fund the management of the land, which means there's, there's more grouse. That's really important for two reasons. One, we've got the largest population of red grouse in the world. And two, our heather moorland, we have, I think I'm right in saying about 70% of the world's um, heather moorland is in, is in the UK. So they actually go hand in hand because in order to manage the heather moorland so that you've all been probably up into the hills or driven through the hills at some point, you see all the purple heather. Has everyone seen purple heather before? That purple heather or the, all those like patches of purple heather, that is directly related to grouse shooting because that is the way that they burn different parts of the hill at different times of year um, at, uh, and, and different so that they've, there is um, a spectrum of ages of heather and that's why you see the purple flowers. That is needed for the grouse. So you were talking about um, breeding, grouse breeding and the sort of year on year, making sure that there's enough and helping them to survive. That's part of that management. So actually looking after the land is part of the management to make sure that the grouse have the best opportunity that they have to produce. And when it comes around to the shooting season, what they're doing, and this was touched on when we passed the microphone around, is shooting basically the surplus. So every year, they'll actually go and count the grouse. Believe it or not, they go out and they, not quite, but almost count every grouse on the hill. They've got uh, different statistics to work out by walking the hill and counting it. How many grouse they have this year compared to last year, and they work out how many they can shoot without affecting the population. And it's actually important to realize that if they didn't sh take a surplus off every year, it could actually be detrimental to the population. Now, I think some of you already touched this with, especially with deer, I think it's maybe a little bit easier to understand. If you have too many deer, you can end up with high densities and then you end up with disease and then they die off anyway. The same thing can happen with grouse. Um, not protected. I'll maybe hand that over to you. Well, they're a game bird. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's completely lawful to shoot grouse within the season. So, yeah, I mean, you're, you're correct that there is no sort of, they're not like, you know, for sea eagle, for example, there, where you just cannot touch a sea eagle, obviously, for, for good reasons, we know why. Um, so, yeah, they're very different from that perspective. I think what you were trying to say there was that, you know, if, if, if there wasn't a reason to keep them, um, to keep a sustainable population, that maybe no one would care, and then the management would stop, and then there wouldn't be any grass at all. Is that what you were meaning? Yeah, that's a really good point. I guess mm. it's true. Grouse are actually afforded protection, uh, originally under the Game Act of 1831, which basically defines their closed seasons, uh, but also the Wildlife and Countryside Act, which limits the actual methods which you could be used to kill an animal. Um, so the, although, like Jules said, it's not the protection like you see on, on raptors, there is still protection in legislation, uh, even for animals which can be hunted. It's also important to understand that uh, for any of these species, which are game species, of which that's you know that's what we're talking about, species that you can hunt, is that it is in the interest of the people who are hunting them to make sure that they're there for next year. Because if you, it would be ridiculous to go out shoot absolutely everything. So you have a big pile. You've done loads of shooting that year. You've got a, a big pile of game, loads of food, and then next year there's nothing. 
And there isn't really anybody, well, I say anybody, there's very few hunters, or I would probably say that they wouldn't really be classed as hunters who think like that. It's all about the sustainable management for next year, for the year after, and for the next generation. And there are, there are a lot of examples in history where populations of animals in this country and in other countries around the world have plummeted or crashed, not as a result of hunting, uh, normally as a result of agricultural practices, um, uh, regulation and legislation by different governments around the world where they wanted land cleared for food production or whatever else they were, they were um, interested in at the time, you know, talking back decades ago. And it's actually hunters that have said, oh, hold on a second, you know, bears is a good example in America. We need to protect these bears. They were all being shot for agriculture because they were eating sheep and other cattle. Let's protect them and manage that population. And there's lots of examples around the world where, in actual fact, it's been hunters that have made sure that those populations don't go extinct and have actually increased them year on year. Two of the best examples of this is rhino, white rhino in Africa and Marco in Pakistan, both of which were almost driven to extinction and both of which have been recovered to quite remarkable numbers today, almost solely as a result of the efforts of hunters. So I think the next thing to talk about would be trophy hunting because that's uh, something that is really divisive. I think most people probably have an opinion, first of all, about what trophy hunting is and whether we should uh, allow it to go on. So if I get some nods around the table here, who's heard of Cecil the Lion? Cecil the Lion? Yeah, got a few hands. So Cecil the Lion was a, uh, a lion shot in Zimbabwe. I'm trying to think if it was last, I think it was last year. Um, by Walter Palmer, who was a dentist in uh, America somewhere. And he shot this line, and that probably rose the profile of trophy hunting as a, uh, as a type of hunting to a level far beyond what had ever been probably in mankind's history. And it really divided opinion. There are some people who say trophy hunting is good, and there's some very good reasons for it. Ivan Carter, um, who we've recorded a podcast uh, with, if you haven't listened to that one, I'd definitely go check him out because he's a really, really interesting guy and he will explain far better than I'm about to in our discussion about the balance between having trophy hunting and not having trophy hunting. Um, but that incidence with, with Cecil the Lion, there was, I'd say, the vast majority of stuff that you saw on social media was massively negative. And people saying, you know, it's, it's disgusting that we should kill animals like that and that we should allow trophy hunting as a type of hunting to exist. So if I pass this around the other side of the table, just maybe tell me what you think, wh what is trophy hunting, and should we allow it? Uh, I think that trophy hunting is like when like you have competitions and you're trying to hunt down like the biggest and most dangerous animal or hardest to like kill so that you get like okay. glory yep. and things. And um, I don't really know if it should be stopped. I'm a bit unsure. Trophy hunting, I think, is when you kill an animal um, that's quite not very common to be killed, just so you can go around saying that you've killed, let's say, yeah, okay. a rhino. Yeah, okay. Or... I think it's like when you kill a rare animal just to like, so you can tell people and be like, I'm better than you because I've killed okay. this animal. Okay. Uh, I think trophy hunting's like when you want, to, you want, like you have the biggest, you've killed the biggest thing and basically you're just like bragging about it and you're like, I'm mm -hmm. better than you because I've got bigger. I think trophy hunting's like when you've got when you hunt for a load but then whoever gets like the one that you not expect like like the rarest and obviously they win and so they've got they've got that proof that you can just go to someone and say, I'm better than you because I've caught this. Okay. I've killed this. One more and hunted it. One more. I think trophy hunting is where you try and kill a rare animal and try and stuff it and put it on your wall okay. or something. Okay. 
Uh, a lot of really great responses there. And in a way, that was kind of the responses that I was hoping you'd give me because I'm hoping I can maybe dispel some of those myths. What you, most of you said is pretty much what we're fed in newspapers. Or if you look through your Facebook feed and you see the little articles that come up, uh, you know, about normally showing you, in fact, I'm, I'll bring up my computer now, and you you probably have seen some of these pictures before. So for those people who are, are just listening to this, I'm just showing them all the picture of Cecil Lyon. You probably saw that before. That's Walter Palmer, Cecil Lyon. You see that? I'll just show you one more. Everyone know what animal that is? Oh, you've even identified it's a white rhino, I'm impressed. So it's a white rhino with a bunch of guys standing behind it with an American flag draped across it. Those are the sort of stereotypical trophy shots, if you want to call that, that you're probably thinking about in your head when, when, when you answered that question. So I would say that a lot of what you said was actually probably true. There are some people out there who want to do it for the glory of saying, look at me, look how cool I am, look what I just killed. I mean, that's that picture I just showed you was probably quite a good example of that, the rhino with the American flag dra draped across it. They just want to go out, kill something that was bigger, however it's measured, whether it's horn size or the size of the mane or something, than maybe their buddy did, and stick it up on their wall. But there is a big difference, and that is, that is probably what classically would be described as trophy hunting. But there is a big difference between trophy hunting and the individual person who wants to do it, and trophy hunting as a management tool. So we've all been talking about management today. You know, we were talking about grouse, we were talking about deer, we talked about it in, in the presentation, and how all these species with man placed on the land and the way that we've changed land over time they require to be managed. So any of those species, your lions, your rhinos, your red deer here, your grass, it's all the same. All of it needs managed if man is to have a place in that land. Now trophy hunting as a as a management tool, especially in countries like Africa, which is probably what most of you think about when you say trophy hunting. It's it's the somebody said rare species. That's true to some extent, but it doesn't have to be rare species for for um, to, to be classed as a trophy. The rhino is a, a really great example, as I mentioned earlier, of how trophy hunting as a management tool has actually increased the populations. So there was a period of time in Africa where there were almost no rhinos left. And it had very, very little to do with hunting as a sport. Hunters realized that this was a big problem and the populations had declined. They started to protect them. They started to permit the system and they started to sell the right to hunt the trophy. There's a huge amount of money that goes into the rural communities and the different countries in Africa as a result of trophy hunting. So yes, you are correct in saying there might be a uh, the reason why somebody wants to kill a trophy might very well be because they just want to be the think that they are better than everyone else. But as long as the reason that the animal is being hunted is part of a greater management plan, so that it's actually protecting that species in the long run, then you can take exception with that person for their moral reasons of wanting to kill something but not necessarily the the type of hunting that's taking place. Do you want to say something? Yeah, sorry. Great, yes, grab the... Well, it's not just because of trophy hunting, but it's part of it that mm -hmm. there's no less than 100,000 giraffes left in Africa. I can't comment on the statistic. The giraffes, yeah, uh, that might very well be true. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have, to, I'd have to check that out. I did indeed go and check, and the young girl was absolutely correct. Uh, the number that she gave, it came out in a report actually that uh, that morning or the day before, and it was in a couple of newspapers, and it came from a report from the IUCN, which had, uh, stated that the population of giraffes had declined rapidly over a period of 30 years to a number less than 100,000. Uh, but interestingly, if you read the report, it doesn't state 
legal hunting as one of the reasons at all, and I would have been surprised if it had done. Uh, the reasons it lists as habitat loss as a result of farming, deforestation, illegal hunting and civil wars, which has been a, a major reason for a lot of declines across many species, especially, uh, especially in the Central African countries. Um, so it's, it's quite a good example of headline grabbing, I think, or maybe reading what you think it says without really looking at, at the detail. There is, there is some, I can maybe, I can comment on some of the other species though, because there is this really big gray area where when you see stuff on the news, they might say it's being hunted when actually it's being poached. So elephants are a really good example of that. If you look in um, Botswana, um, sorry, not Botswana, in Tanzania right now, they've lost about two thirds of their elephants. But that's not because some guy or girl paid a lot of money to go and shoot an elephant. That's because of poaching. Every, I suppose most of you here have heard of uh, rhino poaching that's been going on, R horns going uh, mainly over to China. So those the, the decline in rhino numbers right now actually has nothing to do with hunting and absolutely everything to do with poaching. So it, it's, it's quite a good example of how uh, the media blurs the lines between something that's a, a legal activity and something that's an illegal activity. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to realize that trophy hunting, although it might seem, it might not sit comfortably with you as to why somebody would want to go and kill a lion, the money that that brings in and everything that goes around that is actually means in some cases, like there's a one reserve in Zimbabwe, where they went from having a cattle ranch, a really, really big cattle ranch, and having nothing there because they shot all the lions and they pretty much shot everything that ate anything that would compete with the cattle to turning it into a hunting reserve. And now they have one of the highest densities of lions in the world because people come in, they pay to go and hunt it, and then that money goes back into protecting the area. Um, why those people want to go and hunt the lion, well, you'd, you know, you'd have to ask them that question. Um, but then again, what is the difference between taking the life of a lion and taking the life of a red stag with 12 points, 12 point antlers on its head? It's, uh, it's still life. What about fish? Who thinks a fish's life is more or less important than say a red deer? So let's, okay, let's do a show of hands. Who thinks a fish's life is more important than a, a red deer or um, a sheep or a goat. I've got some not sures. You think a fish's life is more important? Who thinks it's more important that we take care of your the you know the, the red deers, the big animals that we see on the land, than a fish? You think it's more important? I would say there's probably a perception that people don't really care about fish all that much. But why do you think that is? Okay, gra somebody grab a microphone and tell me why people don't really seem to be worried that much about fish, but they, you know, they, they care about red deer. It's because, like, there's a lot more fish, and there's, but there's not a lot of red deer well, compared to the numbers of fish, so people want to, like, they, don't, they want to, like, protect the red deer, but not the fish. Okay, we've got loads of hands coming up. Grab the microphone and tell me what you think. I think, like, people don't really think of fish, like, they just think, well, we live on the land, they're in the ocean, why, what, but red deer are like us on the land, so why, why should we care about fish, they can do what they want in the ocean kind of thing. Yeah. Like. Well, first, we don't really see fish as much, like, compared to, like, deer and stuff, like, we see them... We could just see them near our homes or anything. We are a uh, fish. There are a lot. Um, we don't really see much of their lives. So you think it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, yeah, you just don't think about them because you don't see them. I think some people think because, like, so when you were like maybe for your birthday you wanted a dog or a cat, and then you get a fish. A fish doesn't do as much as they do. But um, I feel that none of them, like, they're all just as important as each other. And without fish, we wouldn't have as much food and stuff as we do now. 
Cool. Let's take one more. Well, I think if you go home and you ask your parents what's for dinner, they say fish, you'll go, oh, yeah. If they say de deer, you'll go, oh, what's... Uh, you'll go, like, I don't want to eat that. I've never tried that. Well, the, the first thing, but we're going to talk about the fish now, is that you all should go and try some game if you have the opportunity, because game's awesome. It's uh, I Certainly, I prefer it to your lambs and beefs, although lamb is very good. But if you have the opportunity to try a game, if you're out in a restaurant, go try it, because you you might be surprised. Don't be put off because... You think that it's a dark meat and you might not like it. But yes, the reason why I asked you the question about the fish is that it's exactly the same as the trophy hunting question. Because people, generally speaking, form uh, an emotional attachment to animals that they feel like they can relate to. So you look at a lion and you think, wow, what, you know, what a magnificent animal. You look at a look at a deer. Most people can, can understand the need to, to manage deer, but you know, they can still get this sort of connection to it. But why not care about deer as much as lions? Or why not care about fish as much as deer? And, um, you know, just pass the microphone over. And, and that's, a, that's, that's a big thing in our society where we care about some animals more than others and we don't make a big deal about some animals, even though it might actually be more important to protect them. Sorry, what were you going to say? I think it might be because, like, some people, like, started thinking about that they need to be protected because, like, they saw that, like, either, like, they look cute or something, like, when they had, like, the babies of, like, the animals or, like, when they were smaller, that they look, like, nice, like, dogs, like, that's the reason people have them because they're helpful and they're, like, really cute, that's why most kids want them. Yeah. Uh, and fish, they, like, they don't, they're not really cute because they're, like, big, kind of... Well, yeah, that's what I think, at least, about why people don't like... We'll take a, uh, everybody's clearly animated about this question, so let's take a couple more and then we'll, uh, we'll start to finish up. Um, quite a lot of people are scared of the ocean, are scared of things in the ocean, uh, like sharks and stuff, so they normally relate to those fish to sharks or whales or the ocean if they're scared of it. So they kind of try and stay away from those animals. Cool, sorry, two more. Oh, there's lots of people, lucky dip. Uh, I, I I go for course fishing. So oh, great. I fish, so like, I see like baby fish when I go fishing when, in breeding season. And I see them like when they grow up. Yeah, so I think since the ocean's a big place, People don't see every animal mm -hmm. when on land. Most people have discovered land. So they know it's on it. Okay, last one. I think, like, the reason, like, people don't really care about that many animals is because they could look at, like, one animal and say, oh, they do this and they do that, but then they look at another and it's like, what what have they done for us? What can they do for us? Why, why should we care about them? Because they're... Like just nothing to us. Mm -hmm. I think the, the 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 key and the reason I asked you that question is that everything's important, and the the media tend to make a bigger thing out of species or things that have happened, like the trophy hunting, like the Cecil the lion, like the the hen harrier question, which you, you probably, hen harrier and grouse shooting is the, the 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 big thing that comes up quite a lot, because. It's a species which they know they can get a lot of mileage out of, and people will feel like they're you know, enraged about something that's happened. Whereas there's a lot of things in the world going on across a lot of species that are equally as important, but they don't get the attention. So always be, have an open mind when you see something come up in newspapers, when you see something come up on social media saying, you know, hunters wipe out whatever the species is or hunters are, are, are doing something which has a, a negative impact and read it digest it and then try and think for yourself and ask questions always ask questions ask the questions that they're not asking or answering in the article uh, and that's that's a really important takeaway from i think probably fr you know from today from the presentations and also from from the podcast is always want to ask your own questions and understand where things sit in the world and never always take uh, your information from one source. The shooting world's not always right. The 
parts of society who are against it and the organizations are not always right. There's common ground in between and there's things to take from both sides. I don't know if you want any to say anything just to finish up. Yeah, this. I agree. I mean, obviously, earlier on when I was talking to, to you and, and the rest of your classmates, you know, I, I gave you a lot of information. That's all coming from, from me and my organization. You know, my, my job, the thing that I spend my life doing is, is protecting and promoting the rights of people like me and Byron and the rest of our members. So, you know, that that information, other people might not agree with it. So I'm not here to brainwash you today. I'm just here to get you thinking. So I'd love it if you guys off went off and um, did your own research and came to your own conclusions about these things because they're really important questions. You know, environmental stewardship, sustainability, population management. You know, these are really key questions that, you know, with the ages that you are going forward for the rest of your lives with resource depletion and all the other problems that are facing us as a as humanity, you know, the things that we're talking about around the table today, they're all relevant. So it's a really important thing that you're showing interest that you've wanted to come along today. I think that's brilliant that you're all sitting around here telling us what you think because we want to know and you know do do go off and do your own research don't just believe what Byron and me are saying you know it's I know that not all of you around this table are convinced about all the arguments about shooting and hunting but that's not a bad thing you know we we have to have different views and then you know we can work together and find common ground so that we can all live the lives the way that we'd ideally like to so it's been uh, really great having a chance to speak to everybody here and I've been Really impressed by the amount of engagement we've gotten. I can Definitely. see that you, you've all done your your research, which has been you know fantastic. And you know, fast forward 10, 20 years, some of you might have the chance to be making decisions that determine what we do with our land. And with our land comes the animals that are on it and the people who inhabit it. Uh, so always look for all the angles. And always try and think of, of the, the slightly bigger picture. And probably most importantly, try not to get too emotionally attached to something. You need to th think about most things in a logical way. And just because you personally might not agree with something that's going on, always look at it in the, in the slightly bigger picture. And you need to look at it in the collective. It's a little bit like you might disagree with that person who wants to shoot something just because he wants to put it on his wall. But hunting as a, as a general thing can be good. There's the bell. Perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. And with that, we are signing out for 2016. That's it. Last podcast of 2016. Yeah, we... Well, I did want to do a news this week, but I think we'll save a news. There's been a lot happening over the last think, two weeks. Yeah, and considering that it's only like one day now until... One day, uh, so we can get you one. I mean, we will. We can give you a, a rough outline. Lee against Cruel Sports has been lying again. A few other things in the shooting world going on. We'll cover all them in a week. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll 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 bring you a news update uh, early part a of week, 2017. Two weeks. Yeah, two weeks, yeah. I mean. Uh, and then we'll also bring you be bringing you a brand new guest. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is, uh, well, just in case people weren't aware, there is actually an ongoing incident right now. I don't have much more information, uh, but there is avian flu going on in the UK. First case has just been found in Scotland. Uh, I do actually, I tell you what, I do actually have a full update on that. So what we'll do is I will uh, give you the PDF and if you if people want to uh, visit our website, thepacebrothers.com, check out the podcast tab, useful documents. We'll stick oh, it there. there you go. Um, I just thought everybody should know because if you didn't know about it right now, it might affect you. Yeah, and you okay. should know about it. And it's a very, very important thing that could uh, damage uh, lots of things. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very serious consequences. So, yeah, that's where you'll find uh, it's all over the government website. So you can just Google it. But I will stick it in uh, the useful docs on our website just in case you don't know where to find it. Well, we hope you've enjoyed a year with us. And we hope you continue another year with us next year. We've, uh, we're very grateful for all of the listeners, the thousands of you that have tuned in, and we hope thousands more of you tune in next year. And all we ask is you keep telling people about the podcast. We've got some more things coming next year, so hopefully we get even more people involved in the podcast. Um, but yeah, thank you. And keep leaving us reviews. Remember, you can 
listen to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and most of the episodes are on YouTube as well. Uh, we're on other platforms as well. There's TuneIn Radio. iHeartRadio. Th- iHeartRadio. I think that's more of an American thing, but we do have quite a few American and Canadian listeners. Um, so that's a recent... Uh, we've applied to be on Spotify. It's extraordinarily hard to get your podcast on Spotify. Uh, if you go on Spotify, they only have a very, very small selection of them right now because they're still in their beta testing. I hope that everybody had a really fantastic Christmas, and I hope you have a brilliant new year, which, when this podcast goes out, will be in a day's time, I think. Yeah. Uh, And for those people who are also UFC fans, of course, by that point, you will know who's going to win the big fight on the night of the 30th. Yeah, you will. Will will Ronda regain (laughs) her title? We'll hopefully have some UFC fighters on next year. Yeah, there There are are a couple who are hunters. Yeah, Yeah, a few uh, hunters. Uh, so th- and uh, who else have we got coming on this next year? I can't remember all the names of the people. Uh, I think. Well, I'm gonna let's. We're gonna. Uh, we'll give you a list in our first podcast of January. Yeah. Okay. We'll uh, do that. Because I'm still confirming a couple of names. I don't, I don't want to give names and then disappoint people. Uh, <laughs> we uh, the series is now complete. Into the wilderness. All six episodes are now out. I hope everyone's enjoyed that throughout the year. So if you've not seen that, go and check that out. Uh, we've got more stuff coming up. We've. Uh, well, actually, the most recent thing, which was not part of our series, uh, which is out, which we filmed, uh, is a film called Tested to the Edge. And if you go and onto, f- I think it's only on Facebook right now, but it will be on the websites. If you go and visit the Leica Sport Optics or the Mauser yeah, it's on both Rifle right now. Facebook page, it's the top video. And we've shared it on our pages yeah, as well. Yeah, we have. So, so it's In fact, we, we might even cool. put it on the podcast page. So if you look at the podcast page, yeah, we we'll, we'll put we it on that. Um, but that's a pretty cool film as well. And uh, we've got loads of other things and proj- uh, projects on the go for 2017. The next thing that you'll probably see from us will be our output from Norway, which we came back from in October. Yep. And well, I think that's it. Yep. Have a very good new year. Remember, don't be shy. Email us, message us, podcast at Pace Productions UK. And uh, we hope to join you again in next year, all of you again next year. Yep. Well, we'll be here. Hopefully you'll be here as well. Next time we speak to you, it'll be 2017. So down the river, the channel, knock on and pack. The water's running fast and it's strong. That I still lack. The water rain, it covers my tracks. And I don't think I. So